What's the furthest south a Scottish army ever penetrated into England? I think you might be surprised. If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen. In the meantime, let me take you on a journey. This is Carlisle Castle. It's been besieged by Scots from the time of William Wallace to Bonnie Prince Charlie's Jacobites. And yes, I know Jacobites weren't uniquely Scottish and Scots weren't all Jacobites. Anyway, the answer to the question isn't Carlisle, although the tensions that caused this Scottish army to march did involve a dispute over lands in this very area. But we have to go further south to find out. We're now just south of Derby. This is how far Jacobites got with Bonnie Prince Charlie. In fact, this memorial tells you this cairn marks the furthest point south reached by the Jacobite army of Charles Edward Stuart on the 4th of December 1745, erected by the Charles Edward Stuart Society and Marston's Brewery on the 250th anniversary. Now, I assumed they must have made a lot of cash from Scottish Jacobites drinking the weak beer down here, but it turns out that this is now the beer garden of a Marson's pub. Either way, a Scottish army reached much further south than this, and it was much earlier than 1745. If you watched my video about how Henry II stole the north of England from Scotland in 1157, you'll know that Henry wasn't only a killer of Canterbury archbishops, but a reneger on promises to Scottish kings. Not only was this the reason that Alexander II came south with an army 60 years later, it's also the reason that he, a Scottish king, was named earlier that year in England's Magna Carta. If you get nothing else from this video, then there's a pub quiz question for you to savour. If you did take anything else from the video, then it's about Alexander II and the furthest that a Scottish army got south in England. It's kind of about dishonest English kings as well. I cover some of the things that led up to this in my video about why 1157 may be the most important date in Scottish history. I'm not going to lie, there will be some who get caught up in the whole Scottish English thing, but let's just remember it wasn't us. It was 800 years ago, so calm down. If your ex times great granddad was involved, then they probably didn't have YouTube. So you making a fool of yourself arguing in the comment section isn't going to help anyone. Some folk will still do it, you know that. If you want to say something in the comment section, then put your guess for how far south we are going to get. Oh, and whilst you're in the bit underneath the video, why not click through to the shop and buy a mug or one of these or other groovy t-shirts on offer. The point is that a while back, Henry II of England had taken Cumbria and Northumbria from Malcolm IV. He was the grandson of David I of Scotland, and he was known by the epithet Malcolm the Maiden. After a short reign, his brother became William I, or William the Lion. See, when posterity knows you as Malcolm the Maiden and your brother as William the Lion, it makes you wonder if you should have made a different choice of favourite toy when you were a bairden. But that's what brings us to William the Lion's son, Alexander II, who this video is about. He still wants those lands in the north of England back. Of course, things had happened in England as well since Henry II reneged on that land deal. Henry had killed Thomas Becket, faced rebellion from his own sons, and later he died. Now, the two of Henry's sons that concern us are Richard I, the English Lion King, and his brother John. He was the baddie in Robin Hood. 
John has problems. He was fighting to regain lands in France. That didn't go well. He had a poor relationship with his English nobles, particularly the ones in the north, which was getting worse. That led to a compromise treaty with the nobles that, along with later amendments, we call Magna Carta. Now, I said that Alexander II was named in the Magna Carta, and he was. Alexander had been inaugurated King of Scots at Schoon on December the 5th, 1214. Of course, in another sense, Alexander's one of the English king's nobles. He held English lands from the King of England. That confusion between Scots kings holding feudal lands in England and being kings in their own right in Scotland, well, that caused upset over sovereignty for centuries. We've already seen what these cheeky English monarchs are like, haven't we? It's a bit like if you had a holiday cottage in France and the French president said, right, that means you and all your lands in Scotland belong to me. That's exactly what it was like. Now that's going to cause comments. The point is that like many English kings before and after, John had tried to impose himself on Scotland itself, not just the bits of England owned by the King of Scots. When Alexander's dad was alive, John had come up with an army and insisted in the right of choosing who would marry off Alexander's sisters. Now let's be honest, monarchs on both sides of the border had looked to increase the lands and people under their control whenever they got the chance. Hence the argument over Cumbria and Northumbria. Now John's problems with his northern nobles gave Alexander an opportunity. In early 1215, some English barons with Scottish landholdings had started appearing at Scottish court, looking for Alexander to help them in their conflict with John. But Alexander was only just in the job, and he decided that caution was the best option. Then, the rebel nobles marched on London, and that's when that whole Magna Carta compromise was signed here at Runnymede on the 15th of June, 1215. The problem was that neither side took it seriously, and England drifted into civil war. The rebel barons did two things that concern us. Now, remember, John had been disputing lands in France. The rebel barons asked the French Dauphin, Louis VIII, to come and be king of England. And the northern barons were happy to swear allegiance to Alexander. On October the 19th, Alexander's army crossed the Scottish border and took homage at the barons in Northumbria. How far south did he come? In January 1216, when King John moved against his barons in the north, they turned again to Alexander and reaffirmed their homage and fealty. John crossed over to Berwick and laid waste it. Poor old Berwick gets it every time, doesn't it? But then he continued into Lothian. John went on an orgy of destruction through the southeast of Scotland. Alexander launched a counter raid into Cumberland before John retreated back down south. By August, Carlisle was firmly in Scottish hands again. It was now the seat of Scottish administration over Cumberland and Westmoreland. Effectively, the north of what we call England was part of Scotland. And then Alexander headed over the Pennines to Durham before turning further south. Louis had landed in Kent from France to take the English crown, just like the English barons had asked him. Alexander met him at Canterbury, and the Scottish king and French Dauphin marched south as English landowners, 80 years before the old alliance between Scotland and France. They came here and laid siege to this castle. Louis agreed that Cumberland and Northumbria were Alexander's, and Alexander gave homage for those lands. Nearly 60 years after those lands had been lost to the Scots king through Henry II's duplicity, a Scottish force had come down here. 
The southern lands that the English call north were back in Scottish hands. But John wasn't finished. He might have been weakened, but he wasn't defeated. And John struck at Alexander's lines of communication. Alexander hurried back north to deal with us. And then John did something to scupper Alexander's cause that was even sneakier than his father, Henry II. It was a devious strategy that nobody had expected. Overnight, on the 18th to the 19th of October, 1216, he died. The sneaky bastard. Just when Alexander had got the north of England back, the source of much of the baron's anger was gone. They thought to themselves, hold on, it'll be much easier to deal with John's underage Henry III. They reneged on the agreement with the French king and Alexander found his northern English support dwindling and once again Scotland was denied a load of potential second string players for our international rugby team. The border didn't come south but a Scottish army had come deep into England to besiege the castle here at Dover. I've got a video that explains the detail that Henry II promised to David I and it's coming up on screen now. In the meantime, how many dog is going to be a lamb alive? Sherry and Rasta.